<laughs> Welcome back to Kevin Pollock's chat show. Shockingly, I am back as chat show. Yes, we had a guest host last week, and I want to thank Dana Gould. Mm, mm, mm. As always, damn good vodka. This is uh, the 18th of May. We're coming to you live streaming on the YouTube. Um, I am back from uh, Nolens for a 48-hour uh, uh, respite. Governor's reprie uh, Re <laughs> reprieve. Really? What is it? Who is the, the governor's reprieve? Sure. Who, who is the governor of uh, Louisiana? Any the idea? wonderful state of Louisiana? I literally don't know. So really? This is not a quiz. Oh, you'd like to know. Yeah. All right. If you're in the uh, chat room, write in. <laughs> Because Sam doesn't have the time to Google. I don't, I don't know. I get, our I'd like to help. know who the governor of I'm Louisiana is. I'm a little busy uh, trying to welcome people back to the show. Fair enough. Um, that's my way of saying having a clue. <laughs> um, maybe I'll get to know him now that I've said that. Uh, when I get, return uh, tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Back in the set at 1.35. So I've been told. I'm having a blast there. I've uh, convinced the writer-director to change the title. Huzzah. <gasps> no more mind puppets. From the worst title in cinematic history, Mind Puppets, Mind Puppets to uh, when I count to three. Governor of Louisiana is Bobby Jindal. Yeah. Or Jindal. Yeah. That's J -I -N right. Jindal? He's going to, Jindal, yeah, he's going to, uh, you heard it here first, kids. Uh, he's going to make a run for the White House. <laughs> really? Yep. Yep. You're Bobby Jindal, you're Ted Cruz, they're going to be battling it out come uh, 2016. You did hear it here first. You heard it here first. Because I guarantee you that conversation is not taking place anywhere else. <laughs> Just I like to break the news. Bobby Jindal, Ted Cruz, fight to the death for the Republican seat. Now, Sammy, you were also not here last week. You no. enjoyed your uh, lovely Mother's Day. Indeed. And how was Lynn's uh, day? Lynn, uh, her day was wonderful. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, Roberta Levine, my, my sweet, sweet Nana, her, her Mother's Day was also wonderful. Uh, your sweet, sweet Nana? My Nana. My Lin grandma. Lynn's mother? Uh, no, Harris's mother. Ah. Yes. Uh, you took the two ladies out. We 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 had a whole thing. It was a wonderful day. Michigan. There, there was Michigan. There was there was gifts. There were cards. There were tears. Wow. Everything you could have hoped for on Mother's Day. Was it a buffet? Uh, the tears were mostly from me. I should add. <laughs> um, uh, there was there was no there was no buffet. We had Italian food like the Jews do. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I've not heard that. Yeah. I can't imagine you eating at, at a buffet. It happens about once every uh, once every Olympic. Yeah, Olympics, I'm yeah. not a fan of the buffet. Every Winter Olympics. I don't know, yeah, it's difficult to... Uh, food made mass. To get mass. excited about food made Eating for th 300 trough. people in a trough, yeah. yeah. yeah well, it's just because you... The, the, <laughs> Let me get some of those pieces. Oh, I, That's, see. I, I think how a, can you? I think a Vegas vacation. Yeah. <laughs> like, which one's the chicken and which one's the beef? Oh, wait. It's, and they you can't. <laughs> I'm out. Right. All right. I have a hard enough time eating birthday cake. Do you? Yeah. Because Ask me why. Why? All right. Imagine I'm gonna, imagine imagine I'm about to hand you an apple. <laughs> Here you go to eat this. Oh, I see. They've blown out That's the candle. That's disgusting. They've blown out the candle. That's disgusting. Spittle, all over it. So, you'll go to someone's house or restaurant or yep. place yep. and celebrate their birthday, but you'd rather not have their spittle on your food. Don't give me your spit cake. All right. <laughs> spit cake. <laughs> Which, by the way, fought under that name in the '70s. I sure did. Yeah. It was also my clown name. <laughs> Jamie, uh, did you enjoy having the Dana Gould and the Kelly Carlin here? I did here? very much. I am such a fan of Dana Gould. Yeah. And, I could, and it's so easy for me to set him up for his own bits, like I yes. him, which was great. Um, he's so funny. But I was going to comment on my mother, uh, my mother's mother Please? today, because I was at, uh, you know, I get my love of Disney from my mother, and I was at Disney World the week prior, and I was like, oh, this is a great opportunity for me to, you know, bang out her Mother's Day slash birthday gift as well, because her her birthday is May 11th, so it often falls. On Mother's Day, and I'm looking, over, you know, I'm looking at all the merchandise at the theme parks, and she had just been to Disneyland visiting here a couple weeks prior, and I'm like, she bought, she has it all. Yeah, she bought it all. Literally, she has bought every, like, I'm like everything I saw. I'm like, she has it all. There's nothing I could get her, so I ordered her some Pro Flowers, which is a former sponsor. Yeah. Of the chat show, and she totally called me out on it. She's like, oh, so I see you got. Well, at least you did the upgrade. I see you didn't go for the 19.99 Pro Flower <laughs> special. You went for the 29.99. At least you went for the upgrade. And she totally called me out on me using like the chat show sponsor, the, using the coupe. I one. used the chat show <laughs> coupe as well for my mother, as did Josh Negrin. Anybody else on the staff uh, send their mom pro flowers? 
J Mac did as well. Why the fuck not? She loved it. She Come said on, it people. It was just fun. You know, she was just teasing me. But yeah, we've got a sponsor today. You can support them too. I can't wait to tell you about them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> It's very personal to me today, sponsor, and I can't wait to share it with you uh, about halfway through the interview, which I think we should now get to. Um, so thanks to Anna Gould and Kelly Carlin, who was the guest last week. Check us out on The Earwolf. Let us know how you watch the show and listen to the show by writing to us at contact at kevinpollockschatshow.com. And I, uh, I promise, do I, uh, to read all of them. Well, all of them that J-Mac forwards to me, he will sift through, as is his want, to protect me from some of you idiots? Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> um, you know who you are. You, you probably are favorites. Um, okay, subscribe, write a review. You know the drill. Support us. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today, uh, Jamie and I first met accosted. I think this is the first time he met. Well, he'll correct me. We accosted him at Sketchfest a few years back. It was like three years ago. Yes, it was. Uh, at least three years. Because um, it was right before I turned 30. That's how I remember. Ah. So, yeah. This is how you date things. Yes. Around uh, aging. <laughs> it's helpful. And we accosted him, I think. Uh, not knowing anything about him personally. And um, have, have since become uh, considerably more friendly. But uh, we accosted him because we admired his work so very, very much on uh, one of our favorite television programs of all time. Unfortunately for my guest today, he has since been um, inundated, if not overwhelmed, by the love of uh, his work as the character that we all celebrate as Badger. Consequently, we won't talk about Breaking Bad at all today. <laughs> so those of you who tuned in and dialed us up to hear some stories from the set of Breaking Bad, go fuck yourself. I gotta go. <laughs> gotta go? Sammy just, Sammy, Sammy just tapped out. Uh, if there's one thing. Take it easy, guys. Uh, commitment. <laughs> 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 only. <laughs> I ask only one thing from my crew, and that's commitment. If you do a bit, commit to it. Sammy just started his car. By the way, one more shot of uh, Sammy's vacant seat and the glass doors. I do want everyone to see the finger marks. <laughs> there goes Sammy committing the bit. But look at the finger marks on the door. Look at that's the worst in history. It hasn't been cleaned in five years. All right, back to the show. Sorry. Uh, Sammy, thank you for, for giving up on the bit eventually. That, you know. Um, please welcome Matt Jones. Hello, Matty. Hey. Uh, uh, when did you ask people to stop calling you Matty, by the way? Uh, I... No one has ever called me Matty. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes! I, I, think, I, I think a couple of people called me Matty in my lives, and I hated them. Yeah. And just never spoke to them again. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like to tell the story from the set of Newton Boys when Matthew McConaughey first day, said mm -hmm. to Vincent D'Onofrio, yeah. <laughs> that story, when Vincent said, uh, hey, Matt, and uh, McConaughey, as the story goes, allegedly wheeled around double guns, <laughs> names Matthew, good thing we caught it on the first day, That's good. and then spun around and went uh, looking for an uh, Oscar acceptance speech. That's being your own hero. Yes, yeah. that is being your <laughs> own hero. <laughs> it was born on that day. Yeah. Oh, man. Good Lord, Lordy. So, uh, um, let me start here. You've been quoted as saying that for Halloween, you once wore a black bomber jacket and carried a baseball bat, calling yourself gangsta, but really, you were just really poor. <laughs> Please explain. Uh, I, that's weird. Mm -hmm. um, well, our research goes deep. So. Yeah, Jesus. Um, uh, I, my parents were very Christian. Sure. So they didn't really support Halloween. So Are they much. comfortable with you being uh, seated across from a Jew presently? Uh, <laughs> no, no, they're not that Christian. Oh. Uh, if you were gay, that's not that. <laughs> um, There's uh, still time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we were just, um, they would ne I never got a ho like a Halloween costume my whole life. I because of think. the pagan thing? Yeah, and also because like we didn't have the money to get it. Sure. So like I had friends that we would, I grew up in a kind of a poor neighborhood in LA called Pomona. Sure. Uh, it's like, if you're too poor to live in LA, you move to Pomona. <laughs> like, if you can't live in South Central, you like move to the burbs. It's like the shitty burbs. Wow. Um, and uh, 
we uh, we were really broke, and so I, I had got a bomber jacket for like Christmas, like three years beforehand, and pre we, pre owned, I'm guessing pre owned, yeah, from M and I surplus, uh -huh. uh, Army surplus store, and then we took our friend uh, parents drove us up to like the rich neighborhood, which is like you know ten miles away in this city called Claremont, where I eventually moved, and um, there they had like the best. Uh, trick or treating ever. It was, it was amazing. Like, we were, there was one that was wrapped. Like, oh, no. Like, <laughs> there was like a, a, a laundry basket filled with full size Snickers and uh, Milky Way bars. Full size? Full size. <laughs> Never to be seen again, by the way. And it said on the side, it said, Please um, take six. Please take one on your honor. And we just dumped the whole bag. <laughs> yeah. whole of, and I, that's why I was a fat kid. Yeah, uh huh. <laughs> that's why. Mm -hmm. That one laundry. It has nothing to do with my relationship with my parents. <laughs> <laughs> and bingo, was his memo. Mm. Well, that's yeah, pretty so, fantastic. Uh, I, was, I was a homemade um, poor kid's Halloween costume. But you, uh, you referred, somebody referred to it, possibly you, as gangsta. Yeah, that's I, was I your was idea. A, I was a gangsta. Uh -huh. yeah. It was during the whole 90s rap craze. A lot of bomb, bomber jackets. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, you, uh, in another interview, um, eventually had some disparaging things to say about um, the, the direction that the rap world went, which, uh, rather than re-quoting the whole thing, I thought I would just ask you, what was your experience coming of age when that rap music was really sort of born with Run DMC and what have you, and, sure. and then exploding into a whole other... Uh, I grew up with... Uh I grew up in a very urban environment, uh -huh. so uh, a lot of um, I thought that the I thought racism against black people didn't exist anymore, and it was only like black people hated white people because <laughs> I didn't know many white people right. uh, growing up like young, so I listened to a lot of like stuff with them and like uh, there was like rap artists back then like Diggable Planets. Do you know who that is? Doesn't matter what I okay. know, sir. I'm too old for any of this. Where it was more like it went from like um, it went from like Run DMC, which was like party music, to like poetry, and then it became about we're really angry and we're killing people, uh, like gangster rap, and I think kind of lost me on the gang gangster rap. So. Ice T. Yeah. Cop killer. Yeah, but I still do like some N.W.A. if I have, yeah. Sure. If I'm in the mood. Sure, sure. Some uh, B.I.G. But yeah. Nice. Yeah. And. Um, I, I noticed um, also that when you uh, started doing improv at Claremont High School, yeah, yeah, right, you were a kid, like 15, 16? Yeah, 15, yeah. Um, so the, my first question was, what sort of uh, comedy uh, inspirations or, or, or um, just people grabbing your attention from either radio, records, television, movies? I grew up, uh, I collected comedy albums, like records. I used to. Astonishing. That's all I listened to. Like all the old, like uh, Bill Cosby and like Steve Martin. There was this one that in retrospect is not very good, but I loved it for some reason. It Called. was it was Robin Williams live at Harvard in like 1982. Wow. And he's coked out of his mind. <laughs> like you find out later that yeah. that's what was going on. But he like did this whole like improvised Shakespeare bit for like, Ten minutes, yeah. and I just thought it was so, like I just I love that stuff. I yeah. saw him do that live in San Francisco in 1978 mm -hmm. for three minutes, and thought it was probably long enough. Yeah, yeah. So ten minutes live. It was probably three minutes. No, no, no. Like. I have a feeling it was ten minutes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The drugs will uh, elongate the act. But just I thought it was tag. amazing. So yeah, yeah. And then uh, I had a Flip Wilson record. I sure. I just used to go to thrift stores and buy records. Yeah, by the way, just uh, to be clear, in 1982, uh, not to pick on Robin, it, doing uh, coke before performing live was uh, the same thing with um, uh, the, the doping up in baseball before they passed the new rule. Yeah. It was like, if you're not doing it, you know, you're not actually giving yourself an opportunity to succeed. It was that ridiculously in that... Um, everywhere. I shot the. Uh, I was shooting an episode of The Office with Ed Bagley Jr. Oh boy! And I was sitting. I was like, "Come on, give me some like." He worked in the '60s, like <laughs> in like Disney movies and stuff. Yeah. I was like, "Give me like you know, 
Yeah. What is, he was like, well, you, if you weren't doing drugs on set, everybody thought you were weird. Or an asshole. You were an asshole. Like, why do you? Why yeah. Why do you hate us? Yeah. <laughs> why don't you want to hang out? Yeah. It's yeah. hard to. And also, it was just the fun thing to do for the audience, what, or members of the audience, not as a whole, was to just turn on the comedian. That's how you would say, "Hey, man, I really like your stuff." You would also say, "Here, do this." Yeah. Uh, anywho, God. so you collected all these albums. So uh, the Bill Cosby, did you come across his first one? Bill Cosby's a very funny fellow, right with the no in the arc routine? Well, no, because I'm, I'm not that old. Well, as no, of course. As, but if you're collecting discs, you're already... I started with Bill Cosby as himself. Okay. Like, that was right. that was probably the... Honestly, the, the How old probably biggest comedic influence on my life was when, that. Wow. Was now, that, talking, that album. Are we talking the two-hour movie or the Both. truncated... Both. I got the VHS, uh, and then I had the... I had the, the CD. Um, I had the... the, the it was like a two-part album. Yeah. Yeah. Because there, there's missing bits on the album that are on the... Yes, that are in the, that are in the, the, the concert broke my footage. heart. I love that you guys can't. know this. I still can't believe that he just... Still to this day, that he would sit in a chair... For two hours. And rarely, rarely stand up. Yeah, and uh, you just never, never lost interest. Yeah, I, I could not. It is astonishing. Unbelievable. In fact, if you tried to start with that act now as a new comedian, <laughs> yeah, people hate your guts. You would never get past the audition for open mic night. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're gonna sit the whole time because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, you know, we got a whole stage there. You know, I'm a big Bill Cosby fan. You know, that's how Bill. <laughs> that was inspired so. by the master. Yeah, and yeah. I believe he sat. He sat. Dear. Yeah. Uh, so from watching or listening. Two stand-ups. Did you ever contemplate doing stand-up, or was because or, yeah. you drifted to sketch and improv first, or so it seems? I, I was obsessed with stand-up for a long time, but never have I ever had an interest in doing it. Because because the fact is, okay, so I was young, right? And four, five. I was pretty young when I started listening. I was probably five. I started listening to a lot of comedy albums, but then I don't know, right around like uh, pre-teens and stuff. Stand-up was on every channel yes. all the time. It's what killed it. There was so much stand-up on, and I would watch all of it. And even at that age, I was like, yeah, only like one in 50 stand-ups is decent. Right. And, and there's always that brick backdrop. Yeah, brick yeah. backdrop, the yeah. Blazer, tie, loose and tie. Roll the blazer up to yeah, here, roll right. your sleeves up to here. Did you ever do that? Roll your sleeves? We all did it. It was with the coat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the only way you could get the line of coat was if you agreed to roll up your blazer yeah. <laughs> sleeves. <laughs> Like that Bill Maher look, where it was like, oh, it was, it was, buddy, it was all of us. Yeah. It was the 80s. You didn't have a choice. Pop you wanted collar? to fit in. Yeah. I never popped a collar. That was more of a Dave Couillet look. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh-huh. Yeah. Or like Harry, uh, Anderson. Harry, Harry Anderson. Yeah. So I watched a lot of that, but I, even at a young age, was like, I, I would never want to do stand-up because I don't have anything interesting enough to say. Mm. I, I cannot stand when, as much as I love stand-up, I really hate bad stand-up. Well, sure. There's nothing more uncomfortable, actually. Oh, man. Um, in fact, when improv is di dying as a group, you think, well, it's live. They're making this shit up as they speak. They get extra breaks. They're going to pull this out, I'm sure. Whereas a stand-up who's had plenty of opportunity to work out this material before mm -hmm. he stands before me, yeah, you, it's, it is why that high wire, living and dying by your own wits, moment by moment. Like, my worst nightmare is handcuffed to a chair in an open mic night. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, I, it makes me so uncomfortable. So if they were to write the Twilight Zone episode, <laughs> I would, or your character, yeah, yeah, would that be, would be when I could um, speak and my eyes were like open like that. Wow, It'd be terrible. When uh, Clockwork Orange. Yes. <laughs> Sebastian Cabot, Jamie, was that the? Uh, That's Mr. French. Yeah, but w w was that the Twilight Zone episode that he turns out? Oh, he, where he's the devil? Yeah. Because like a gang, uh, a, a gangster the dies hoodlum. and goes to yeah, the hoodlum dies and goes to have uh, what he thinks is heaven because it's like he gambles and he's always winning and he gets uh, all the you know all the women that he wants and whatever he wants you know is that Sebastian Cabot is at his demand you know whatever he wants. Then it turns out that he had had so many riches that he got bored with it, so he ultimately ended up in hell. He really he was finally told that that was his hell. So mm -hmm. your hell would be handcuffed to a chair watching bad open mic stand. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, what is the impetus to try sketch and improv? To be honest, I never made a conscious decision to become an actor or do any of it. it I really didn't. I, I wanted to play sports for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I was like a really big into basketball and football and baseball and I did all of that. And then somewhere in high school, I was a lineman. I was like huge and I played football. And like 
You didn't get any girls. As a lineman. No, no yeah. one cared. Nobody cared in sports. You arguably, as a lineman, had the most difficult job in terms of oh, actual work. Really hard. I was <laughs> yeah. always in pain. Yeah. It was terrible. And then one day in high school, this really hot girl that I liked was like, hey, they're having comedy sports uh, tryouts. You should come. And I was like, actually, like, you would be really good at it. And I was like, oh, okay, I can hang out. I just did it to hang out with this girl. Sure. And I made the team, and she didn't. And um, and then all of a sudden, like, I was getting girls, like, doing theater. And it turned out that I didn't even realize, but my high school was, like, a theater magnet high school. And then I just became, I just did theater Obsessed. a ton. Yeah. We did eight full-length shows a year in Whoa. high school. Eight? Yeah. yeah. That's unparalleled. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Most we like, do one, maybe two. Maybe we were, two. like, a professional theater in high school. And... I, I learned more professional in high, professionalism in high school than I have anywhere since. Well, I really have. I really have. <laughs> pretty sad. That's astonishing. Yeah, like people get fired. Like if you didn't show up, the, the art theater uh, director would just like, you're done. You're out of the program forever. What was even the like scheduling like on that? Like I feel like you would have to do like a show like every like five or six weeks. Yeah, about that. Yeah. Wow, that's insane. And there was two shows sometimes going on at once. Uh, like one, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, it was crazy. And they had like big budgets. It was crazy. And you were in a lot of shows. Yeah. yeah. You excelled within this very strict, difficult program. Yeah, so in the reverse of football, I went and did theater, and there was a bunch of cute girls and like two straight guys. Sure. And it just cleaned up. It was great. <laughs> I loved it. Cleaned up. Just cleaned up. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so after all of that success, when you break the news to the folks that you're going to go move to Amsterdam, how does that go over? Uh... Because it was a full-on move. It wasn't a visit. Yeah, yeah. It was, I had been doing, I'd been working professionally in L.A. like four years, uh, but mostly just commercials, and I couldn't even get an audition for anything else. Like, I couldn't even get in the room. So, and it started driving me crazy. And, and then right. I got this audition to go to um, my friend Heather Campbell. I don't know if she is. Uh, she's on Who's Line and stuff like that. Um, uh, she and I, uh, she had got the job there and was telling me about it, so I went and did it. And uh, I The left. audition for Boom Chicago? Yeah, I just told my mom, I was like, I'm moving to Europe. My, at that point in my life, my older brothers and sisters were uh, uh, um, not doing too great. So me, it was, uh, you know. You're doing so well, you get to move I to Europe with a job. Yeah, yeah. I took care of myself. And by the way, moving to Europe, great way to couch yeah. the fact, which is you're moving to Amsterdam. Right. Yeah. I like that you sold it. I'm moving to Europe. I am. Europe. <laughs> Amsterdam. Right? Yeah. Sexy. Where weed is legal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Funny enough, I didn't smoke weed in Amsterdam. Funny enough. I really did. Like, you only ate it. You, <laughs> you get there and you like, you're like, oh, I'll smoke weed. And then all of a sudden, like a month in, you're like, I don't really want to smoke weed anymore. And you Because it's everywhere. And Dutch people don't really smoke weed. Right. They think that's a tourist thing. It kinda, it's like, like, oh, you're smoking weed. Ugh. Like that, but they don't talk like that. They're like, oh, you're smoking weed. <laughs> <laughs> they all sound mildly retarded. When they speak. Please give us a little more of that. I like that uh, character. Dutch people like, uh, Who Dutch, is that? Uh, uh, any Dutch person, like Yup or Jan or uh, Mariska. So, like, you'd meet a girl with like a deep voice. She's gorgeous. She'd be gorgeous. Like, I saw your show. You're not very funny. <laughs> Do you, do you want to have sex? And you're like, oh my God. <laughs> yep. <laughs> sure do. Yeah. Can you not talk when we do? <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, and and so, while I was there, every other question was, why George Bush? Uh, why George Bush? Why? What? Like, so this is senior, by the way. Uh, no, this is junior. It was this junior. Was, this was GWB. GWB. Yeah. Uh, George uh, Washington Bridge? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what was it? Um, 2004, I was there. Dear Lord. Well, that sounds like uh, our guest two weeks ago, Jordan Peele, yeah. might have been there at the same time, Matt. Yeah, he, but he talked a lot about Boom Chicago me. and didn't... Didn't mention me on his show. That's he didn't weird. bring up. That's weird. You. It's mm. weird. I was actually in the pilot, I was telling you, of Key and Peele. Yeah. I was in one of the scenes. And when you went over to the Amsterdam... Mm -hmm. He had just left when I got there, ah. but he would come back all the time. Aha. Uh -huh. Just Jordan. get weed. <laughs> <laughs> no, he would come back and... Uh, yeah, we, we, we performed a lot with you, each other. You know what I think it is, if I may? I think he's racist against white I think people. he is. He hates white people. <laughs> Jordan Peele hates white people. That's a fact. That's a fair thing to say. Yeah. That's a fair thing to say. Yeah. He only he likes the half. Mother. The half. <laughs> <He hates his laughs> That's right. Uh, 
So, according to you, and you've probably discussed this ad nauseum, so forgive me, but I, I think for the, for the people who don't know this about you, they should. This extraordinary, unique, one-of-a-kind voice of yours mm -hmm. did not exist prior to your trip to, quote, Europe. No, no, it did not. What I, did you sound like? Can you even remember? I Can had, you fake it? Can you fake it, the sound? It was, it was a lot. It was, it was like this, and it was naslier, and um, so, no, it was you, completely clear. You can't fake it. I can't fake it. You can't bring it back. That's my voice. Are there recordings <laughs> of it anywhere? Uh, yeah, I was in a band, actually. and uh, That's right. I actually don't have it on my phone. <laughs> I would never have that on my phone. But I was in this terrible band called um, Faculty Four. Mm -hmm. <sighs> and, uh, and I was the lead singer, and I sounded like, I don't know, like a girl. I, and who would you compare yourself to? Like who musically singing wise? Like Steve back Perry? Then, back then? That yeah, high? A little Steve Perry, yeah. Really? Yeah, real high. Wow. And now I sound like um, uh, Joe Cocker fucking a raccoon. So. <laughs> More like the raccoon yeah. that Joe Cocker's like fucking, raccoons. I think. Yeah, a raccoon getting fucked by Joe Cocker. <laughs> yeah. Which I think he did on, on camera. <laughs> <laughs> but why the, why the change? What happened? I did a thousand shows in 15 countries in three years. Yeah. I did shows at, with Boom from audiences of 300 to 8,000. Yeah. And so you would, it was a lot of screaming and yeah. telling people to shut up, and uh, a lot of singing, a lot of loud screaming, singing. So yeah. did you, like, did nodules on the vocal? Did you blow I got it checked out. I've gotten the cameras up and down. They just say you're, they're damaged. There's no no nodes. They're yeah. just really It's as up. if you're 92 years old. Yeah. They're just <laughs> aged. You aged your vocal cords. But in return, in, in, in the reverse, it is the greatest thing that's ever happened. You better fucking believe it yeah. because I, be I think you do m more voice work than Maurice LaMarche yeah. or uh, seven other people like Maurice LaMarche. Honestly, a lot of people don't, realize, don't know that that is how I've survived for years is doing cartoons and voices. Survived well, sir. Yeah. I'm not sure well. survived is the word well, we're looking for. That's funny. Thrived, I would push. Breaking Bad yes. was all I did for a long time. Like people forget that the first season I did was 2007. Right. Uh, that was, and then nobody watched the show until, I don't know, 2011, 2012. Like nobody talked about it. Nobody, it, it like became this thing on Netflix that like went out of control, which is great. Some of us were talking about it prior to that. Yeah. For the record. Some. Not, I mean like season three? Is that not what people kind that, of blew up? For people in the know, well, not people that would hire me. <laughs> yeah, without now we're. <laughs> right. uh, so I, I mean, you can't live off of a, um, off of a cable guest star salary. No. Um, no. Huh. So uh, voiceover has really helped. That, that's what did it. Yeah. That saved my ass. For Which, years. by the way, not an easy world to break into. No, but once you're in, you're in. It's great. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. I love it. Um. I work with the same, I'm on five shows, kids' shows, and I work with the same 10 people on every show. Like, yeah. all the time, you see the same exact thing. Yeah, that's what I meant by it's really impossible it's to break in, and then once you're in, it's almost like the firm, you actually can't get out. Yeah, like, I think it's a law, you're not allowed to make a cartoon without John DiMaggio being in it. We love John DiMaggio, he's I been on this him. show. He's a great guy. Yeah. And Billy West. And Billy West, and Billy West together. West. Yep. We had them together. That's great. Um, I have a couple of hard-hitting questions. Are you ready oh for those? Oh, boy. Um, let's just get this out of the way, mm -hmm. please. What's the best aspect of having me at work on the CBS television program, Mom? Uh, if I'm ever feeling a little too up there, uh -huh. there's always someone to come and uh, you know sweep my legs out from under me and break my balls. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, by the way, uh, Kevin is in a movie that I just made. Yes. And uh, uh, we're doing, we're editing, and there is... If I may follow up with my next question. Sure, go for it. Back to you. Uh, what's your favorite thing about directing me in a motion picture? <laughs> I'll give it to you right now. Okay. Uh, we're editing, and there is a, uh, a sound clip of you're off camera, but you can hear him being like, we had, a, we had a, a tough day, the day that Kevin was there. Not anything to do with you, but we had an actor not show up. Right. Um, I remember it was... Uh, we were doing this big, long, steady cam shot, and it was very difficult. And uh, we're, you take forever to set up a steady cam shot. And Kevin's like, hey, Matt, if uh, Ashton Kutcher bursts through that wall, I'm going to 
punch you in the fucking face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's pretty it, funny. It was a slight punk. Uh, uh, there's also the uh, the feeling. point where uh, <laughs> there, the, uh, a truck kept backing up outside, yes. and Kevin goes, Do "You guys hear that? That's the sound of my career." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Hey, hey Jordan Peele, anyone else in this movie? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it? Just Kevin and you? No, just, awesome. Ke just Kevin. Kevin's the only one in the movie. Oh, okay. Sweet. Oh, wait. Sweet. Were you? No. No, no, Sam wasn't in the movie. Sam did a great job. In the movie. Oh, thank I'm you. I'm editing Sam's scene right now. It's really funny. It's really uh, funny. I believe I was at the uh, epicenter of the moment of Sam Levine needs to be in this movie. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had a guy, we had to switch our days, and the guy that we had who we were we had we had done like a casting. We had this great casting director, and we like wanted to cast some of the roles and like have people audition. Sure. And this kid is like a virtual nobody. Gave him this opportunity. We like wanted to do that for people, and he was like, "I can't do it." And we're like, "Okay, well then, fuck you. Let's get Sam Levine." <laughs> I don't know why he didn't call me in the first place. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know why we didn't. What a waste of time. <laughs> yeah. Getting the kids' hopes up. Uh, well, how about that? By the way, when when you've been in town for a while. And you've now worked with hundreds and hundreds of funny people. Yeah. And you start to cast a movie that you've co-written and are co-directing. That's a legitimate thing where you have this pool of talent yeah. to pull from. And at the same time, where does it, where does it end and, and how do you... It's funny because there's a really, it's a fine line of, I, I was the guy that nobody would put in anything for a long time and like was having trouble just getting auditions. And so I really consciously, uh, as a part of this movie, I didn't want to just put in people that work all the time. Right. I wanted to give people chances to do stuff that don't get chances, you right. know what I mean? Like that's very important to me. But also at the same time have people that I, 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 I think are great and would love to work with. Right. Um, like uh, the guy that was in the scene with um, Sam is this guy, Joe, who I think is one of the funniest people I know, and he hasn't got to do a lot, and he was great. He was great. Yeah, so. Joe's last name? Hartzler. Joe sure. Hartzler. Yeah, so I, I wanted to balance that, and I thought we did a really good job doing that, yeah. Um, so you're, you've just started the editing process? Yeah, we're about a week and a half. This is your directorial debut? Yes, it is. That you uh, shared with your uh, writing partner mm -hmm. as well? Dave Hill. Dave Hill, the Dave Hill, mm -hmm. who has been your improv partner yeah low these many years as well yeah we've been doing a two-man improv show for about seven years right six years um at io west and also uh mostly at io west but IO we west. do uh, we tour too didn't you do a little at ucb no i did ucb for like three four years right like three four years ago yeah. okay i did it for a while uh yeah all right, we'll leave it there. Um, <laughs> I love it. They're great. Yeah, no, no. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, there was another question. Of, oh, yes, of course. Sorry. My other question um, that I think was on the minds of everyone was what it was like for you to play at my weekly poker game. Uh. <laughs> That was J-Mac being heard in the background was, laughing, the um, dealer of said game. It was, oh boy, it was like being thrown into a pit of very friendly piranhas. <laughs> very friendly. Welcome to our game. Oh. <laughs> Before they oh, fucked you, you in the ass. Throw in the, I, uh, and then they just like tap you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just like trying to play it. They're like, oh, we're, we're real nice, real cool. Yeah. And then just. Do you want something oh, to eat, something to drink? Yeah, Where can I get you? <laughs> No, it was amazing. Like, uh, I got to play with James Old Brooks. Sure. He, I, I beat him a couple times, which felt great. Yeah. I, I got my ass kicked by that one lady. Um, <laughs> by that one lady. Yeah. Shelly. Shelly Azov. Shelly, Shelly yeah. Shelly Azov kicked yeah. my ass. Yeah. Um, uh, it was really fun, but it was. I, I'm not. Had you played in a game? I, I, I could tell that you'd been playing poker forever, but I wasn't sure if you had played in a game of those states. No, I had never. Right. No. And so I, you yeah, stepped it up. I just have to get used to. You stepped it up as sort of like, well, I'm going to see what this feels like. Yes. Because I remember the, that transition myself. And it from feels playing... like heart palpitations and sweating, <laughs> and I, I need to stop eating so much. <laughs> like I was just eating, nervous eating, <laughs> all these delicious things to eat. Yeah, it was and, fun, though. And then you and um, your co-star, Nate, Nate Cordry. And Lenny, which was hilarious. 
But you and Nate, uh, as it turns out, both witnessed something happen yeah. during the game away from the poker table. And we took a break. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, um, your girlfriend, Jamie, Jamie over there, has this beautiful uh, uh, Simpsons Legos kind of fully assembled fully assembled house with like the characters mm -hmm. and we saw James L. Brooks adjusting the Simpsons characters within around, the house within the Lego Simpsons house Lego house but, but like over it like a little kid taking his time with no one else around nobody and nobody was in the room and to his knowledge no one watching no, either it was totally surreal <laughs> I created you <laughs> it's like God messing with his, his minions it literally amazing. it's great that he's a genuine fan of the Simpsons like he he could quote it yeah. with the best of them he loves it like I have my, my Christmas tree is all Simpsons ornaments and he just stares at it like this is this is great. Yeah, yeah this like, is like and remembering yeah. certain yeah. ones from 20 years yeah. ago. Yeah, and like sitting there and talking to him about like he was getting a car. We're like talking about car advice, and it was just like, I don't, where am I? <laughs> what the hell am I doing? What am I doing? Yeah. Um, okay, well, just one more biting question, and mm -hmm. I promise this one is not about me. But please, if you would share your experience of figure roller skating at age five in a rainbow leotard. No? Did yeah. it ring a bell? Yeah. A little does. bit? Yeah. Wasn't, wasn't, didn't think this story would come up? Yeah. It's weird. <laughs> uh, when I was, my aunt and sure. my mom were a part of that late 70s roller skating craze. That was like, they used to like, my aunt was in a, uh, like a, it was like figure roller skating, like a, a, a partner, uh, what do you call it? Sure. Team. Team roller uh, skating. And they would go and they would tour America and do like shows and stuff. And like so, figure skating, figure skating, pairs, but on roller skates. But on roller skates. Yeah, and she was a part of that. And my mom got me into roller skating, and I was an enormous kid. I was like, was five and looked ten, kind of kid. And um, I won. I got third place in the California Nevada State Championship <laughs> of roller skating. Figure. figure roller skating. Figure roller skating. I, I, okay, so. What the, was your outfit before okay. the incident? So the first two, mm -hmm. I, I had two rounds. The first round, I was dressed as a sailor in a white sailor costume. <laughs> and I remember, We have the photo, hold on. J Max, throw the photo up. No way. Totally kidding. Oh totally kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would have been awesome. Uh, figure roller skating in a white sailor suit. And then I went to play Rad Racer because they had the video games. Oh, and I was like, yeah. Playing. And I remember As a Rad Racer. I was like five or six, and I remember being like, I don't want, I shit my pants, basically. I, I took a dump in my pants. <laughs> and my mom was like. I right remember, before the big. After, after the first round, I got into the second round. And in between the rounds, it was like two, three hours, and I took a dump in my pants. And well, I'm, I'm sorry. Forgive me. <laughs> For jumping in, because yeah, it really is a sure, wonderful sure. story without me. Um, but you, you're on a two-hour break. Uh, that begs the question, why not look for a restroom? I was five. <laughs> I was not very smart. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Again, you're a big kid. Come from a broken family. I don't know. <laughs> what, what excuses do I have? Well, listen. I'm a big kid. I shit myself uh, at kindergarten orientation. Right, great. Which is a fantastic experience and, and, and story to share. But I went looking for a restaurant. Right. Well, I'll tell you, there's a lot of pressure in the roller skating world. <laughs> And I shit my pants. And time. someone had given you coffee. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I was <laughs> pounding espresso. Uh, I don't know. I shit my pants. My mom takes me to the restroom. Like, can't clean it out because it's a white um, <laughs> sailor suit. Uh, uh, what was it? Uh, what's the cheap material that Polyester. sets on fire? Polyester sailor suit. You're in the dress whites. Yes, I'm in the dress whites. The naval dress whites. Yeah, and uh, pants. They, I remember they flared. I look like. Oh. Um, Gene Kelly. No, no, I look like uh, John Travolta mm. in his oh. white Saturday Night Fever pants. Mm. And uh, One so please. she couldn't clean it out. She said, you have to perform again. So she went to the skate counter and was like, do you guys have any other things he could wear? And they only had one thing that fit me, which is a rainbow-colored leotard. Mm. So like a rainbow stripe leotard. Just give me one more second with that. Yeah. Rainbow. Remember, yep. he's a big kid. Oh, and did big I? Kid. And the song that I did my routine to was Macho Duck, which was a re-singing of Macho Man done by Donald Duck. <laughs> How does there not video of this? Macho Duck. Yeah. There is video somewhere. Oh, oh, there was a video of it, but my older brother 
recorded Wrath of Khan over it. <laughs> of course he did. Of yeah. course he did. Because there was no way to ever get that again. Yeah, it was like Matt um, Skating crossed out Wrath of Khan. <laughs> well, that is a classic yeah. example yeah. of how we just didn't understand what the future was, was going to be in terms of what you could record, yeah. <laughs> what you should record over. And also, uh, but I, 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 I don't get embarrassed very easily in right. my life. I think it comes from there. I was like... Well, once you survive a five-year-old who looks like a ten-year-old in a rainbow leotard, having just shit himself, and had to throw away a white sailor suit, I don't oh, think there's, oh, there's any anything that could ever intimidate you. The guy cleaning out the garbage can is like, what the fuck? <laughs> or yeah, <laughs> oh, that guy. Why, why wasn't that? Oh yeah. <laughs> now we're talking. How did you? A how? Little boy's shit. White sailor suit. And then I, I got third place. That's, that was my question. How'd you do? I remember, I remember very, they put us up on the podiums and sure. I was like on roller skates and like afraid to fall off the podium. Yeah. Oh, and man. That was the end of that career. I can't imagine a better segue to our sponsor. So please sit there uncomfortably. The yes, please oh do. God, please. Show, uh, let's go to camera one and allow our guest to uh, find his way elsewhere. Um, all right. Our sponsor today, we're unbelievably thrilled to have them, Regimen Testosterone Support. You heard me. Regimen Testosterone Support. As men age, they can experience weight gain, muscle loss, fatigue, trouble sleeping, decreased sexual performance. Chances are, it's not your fault. It could be hormones. After age 25, men can lose as much as 2% of their normal testosterone levels. By age 50, some men are at half the levels they were in their 20s. Additionally, as those lower levels, at those lower levels, men's estrogen levels can rise. Estrogen can be linked to fat being stored around the belly and chest. I'll say it again, around the belly and chest area, as well as decreased sexual performance. Again with that. Many testosterone su uh, supplements are targeted at 20-year-old males looking for that extra boost at the gym. I won't name names. You know who you are. These may be loaded with caffeine and are potentially dangerous. Regimen Testosterone Support is different. Regimen's Testosterone Support was designed by board-certified cardiologists and anti-aging specialist Dr. Robert Burke as a safe, natural alternative. Regimen is not a hormone replacement therapy. Proprietary blend naturally helps your body produce more testosterone while at the same time providing an anti-estrogen component. Low testosterone may be only a part of the problem. Mm. Regimen proprietary have proven effective in restoring te testosterone levels naturally. Help support lean muscle mass, improve your sex drive, and enhance your feeling of well-being. Rediscover that sexually desirable, energetic, in-shape guy you used to be. Try a 30-day uh, supply absolutely free. How about that? Just pay shipping and handling. Get your free 30-day supply now by simply dialing up repairlowthelettert.com. Repairlowt.com. Slash Kevin. Or call 1-800-869-8826. 1-800-8-excuse me. Wow. I put an extra 8 in there, Kenny. 1-800-569-8826, 1-800-569-8826. That's repairlowt.com slash Kevin or 1-800-569-8826. Thank you to today's sponsor. Um, that copy uh, from the fine folks at Regimen was so long that our guests got to go uh, to the restroom twice and change back into the white sailor outfit. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, wait. Um, yeah, so uh, that, that's all the the the, the painful uh, uh, okay. and now celebrated stories. Okay, because clearly it's not painful for you for, for you anymore. Uh, and let's discuss in part as to why Jamie and I and so many others have accosted you over the years. And what I liked about the research, thank you, J-Mac, was when it, uh, I read that um, according to the original storyline, there was a storyline for your character, Badger, was supposed to introduce Tuco to Jesse, mm -hmm. but something happened to that plan. Yeah. When I got the job, um, yeah, uh, I, was on for, I was supposed to be on for two episodes. That's it. 
Uh, yeah, two episodes. Which season? Uh, season one. Season one, two episodes. I cook with him in the desert, and then I introduce him to Tuco. And in between those two, the writer strike happened. Oh boy! So then they cut the season down to only seven episodes. And uh, Vince called me. He was like, "Yeah, we're not going to have you in the next episode." It was after I filmed my first, because you're too funny and you're too likable, and we don't believe you would know Tuco. So we're going to have someone else introduce him. And uh, the character Skinny Pete had only had like I think one or two lines in a previous scene. And he wasn't even called Skinny Pete, he was just Skinny Stoner. And, um, and then they had, they're like, well, we already have this guy, we'll use him. He looks like he knows Tuco. And then they use Skinny Pete. And, uh, and then he caught, and then Vince is like, but we're definitely, if we get a second season, we'll bring you back. And he brought me back for every season for the rest of the show. Yeah. Uh, by the way, those of you who don't want to hear any spoiler alerts on the show, those of you uh, who are just now tuning in to it, uh, you've been warned. Uh, give me a little background on Skinny Pete, because I will tell you, sometimes you'll see an actor in a show, and uh, you'll say, oh, well, they just got a guy from the actual world. Yeah. By the way, I felt that way when I saw Spicoli in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. That's right. how fucking brilliant Sean Penn was yeah. as at an otherwise trite surfer dude character. In this case... Skinny, yeah. Skinny Pete. He's, his name's Charles Baker. I'll bet. And he is uh, hes much older than you think. He's in his 40s. Sure. He's, uh, he, um, he's like this really intelligent, well-spoken guy. He's a theater actor from uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. So they got him out of Dallas, and uh, he would drive over and do the scenes, and he started off with just one scene. And, and then after, and then there was this point where, uh, Aaron's character, um, uh, Jesse was like showing us, he got this new house or something. It was the first scene that all three of us came in together, me, Skinny, and Combo. And then Combo died, and then just like by default, me and Skinny became this like frickin' frack pair. And uh, that was never the plan, it just ended up happening. And uh, then they just ran with it. But um, yeah, I mean, Charles is uh, nothing like Skinny Pete. And nobody ever notices him in public. Because he doesn't wear the beanie all the time, and he doesn't wear... Right. He has glasses, and he dresses like, you know... An Here's adult. how brilliant Charles is. Yeah. I fancy myself as a connoisseur of good acting. And uh, when bad acting occurs, uh, I find it troublesome instantly. Mm -hmm. Like, I know too much that I can't enjoy certain things. That's a byproduct of, of being at this a while. Jamie, for example notices continuity issues, uh, whether she wants to or not. If someone's necklace is in a different position from, right. from in the same scene, from editing, bad editing choices. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's one of those deals. So for me, it's, it's the bad acting. Charles is so fucking brilliant that from the beginning, first time I saw him in the show, to the very last time, I have always thought this guy is a non-actor, he's horrible, and I don't know why they hired him, mm -hmm. other than the fact that he is 100% genuine as this character, yeah. Skinny Pete. They found some guy in Albuquerque and yeah. said, get away from craft service. You're fired from working the craft service. Yeah. Now you're going to be an actor. That's how brilliant Charles is. Yeah. I Jesus. Mean, I mean, my shit's blown. Well, okay. Am I the only one? No, a lot of people think that. Like, yeah, I, 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 we both, he and I both get that. Uh, while we've been together quite a bit, where they're like, oh, don't you guys live in Albuquerque? And like, why are you dressed that way? And we're like, I don't, we're not those people. We're acting. <laughs> but you, but, but, but you know, listen, Vince I mean, wasn't the only one who noticed that you were funny and charming. It's, it's a byproduct of what you're bringing to the character. And because of that, it never crossed my mind that you were a non-actor. I'm telling you, I saw this uh, fucking guy in the show hmm. and said, dear, am I... You thought he pulled a, 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 a David Simon from uh, The Wire. Yes, yes. Yeah. that's exactly sure. what I thought. Yeah. yeah. Jamie? I was just going to ask, isn't he a very talented musician as well? He's a great musician. He's like a, uh, uh, a, uh, a classically trained pianist. Yes. Make yeah. sure you hit the T. Pianist. He also has a classically trained pianist. <laughs> well. I mean... Those Dallas boys. But yeah, he's... Um, Wow. He's endlessly fascinating. He has 
craziest backstory of, of a life. And he did live kind of hard, similar to that character, but he's not huh. like that. Right. It's, it's weird. Yeah. Um, all right, so you get the good news. You're not introducing Tuco. And the next thing you know, you're coming back to the show on a semi-regular basis. Yeah. And, and I want to know, because according to the uh, research, you were such a fan of Bob Odenkirk, as we are on this show, and, and we're graced with some time with him, which was fucking phenomenal. Uh, but your first time in a scene with him, if you could describe that, because in the research there was something you were alluding to that first time you ever shot with him, and you were such an uber fan of him comedically. Yeah, I my character introduces him to the series because he comes on as my lawyer. And we shot that first scene at like five in the morning, six in the morning, something like that. We both, I didn't talk to him at all. Like we came in and they were like action. And that was the first time I had actually really met him was while we were shooting that scene where he comes in and he's like, I'm your lawyer, blah, 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 blah. So like a lot of that, like what is happening was very genuine. And give a little backstory as to how you became a fan of him from the uh, comedy world. He is, in the comedy world, he's, he's a, um, I look up to guys like him in the way of like he's a writer, he's directed, he's taking care of himself in a lot of ways when he wasn't working as an actor. Like he's just now really working as an actor for the first time. Like he was always more of a writer. Mm -hmm. uh, and besides Mr. Show, you know what I mean? He like wrote on SNL. Yeah. Like he, he did a bunch of movies and pilots and all this stuff. And I always really looked up to that. And he always had. Uh, like his point of view, especially on Mr. Show, was very similar to my own, so I was kind of identified with him. I still think that Ham Hammersley, uh, the, have you ever seen that sketch where he teaches history by playing pool? This is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. I just think it's so stupid. Uh, but like that kind of stuff, um, yeah, it was just a big deal to me working with him. I've been so fortunate to work with people that I just can't believe that I get to work with. Unbelievable. I obviously include myself in yeah, that. Yeah, you are one of those. You really are. <laughs> uh, we had uh, Dr. Cranston here mm. on the show. I feel he wasn't being completely honest about one area of um, of himself. What do you guess that would might be? How how quickly he can turn it on, man! It is unbelievable. From fucking around and they yell action. So like see, season two, he is like ravaged with cancer. Mm. So he lost like, I don't know, 20, 30 pounds. He's like not eating anything. He's running all day long to lose this weight. We're at craft service and I don't know, I was shooting next and he's just joking around with me. We're just, cause he's a, com he's a comedian. And he's really funny. And we're just fucking around with each other. And they're like, Brian, we need you back on set. And like. 30 seconds after we were doing that, like a close-up shot of him yelling at Skylar and crying. And I'm like, I can't do that. No. I can't do that. Yeah. I can't do what he just did. Yeah. And it's good. It's like really good. Yeah. Like that proves the whole like method thing is bullshit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like his, him being able to do that. Right. I mean, Jesus. Yeah. Why do I have to call Daniel A. Lewis Mr. Lincoln? Right, exactly. Why do you have to be an asshole to everybody on set? You're an actor, do your job. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like. Brian and like uh, and like learning from guys like him who are like the lead on the show and then they are the most gracious yeah. and take care of everybody like how to uh, we've talked about this before that some people in LA like feel they have to act like a movie star right. which means you have to be a dickhead for some reason right or, or you don't feel, it's all driven by insecurity which they don't need because they've already succeeded in yeah and he's like the star of the show and he's like goes out of his way to meet every single person and have a conversation and like a relationship with everybody and like make sure they're comfortable. Yeah. Like I did a bunch of NCISs and Mark Harmon is the same way. Yeah. He's like the papa bear on set. Like it's just so great seeing that kind of thing. I don't know, it's, it's a big influence. Right. As far as the, how to act, like act like a professional. Yeah. You know? It's always shocking when they don't. It's. And then it becomes as shocking when people do, like yeah. you say, and they step up and look after everyone. Yeah. Um, that's pretty spectacular. Yeah, I just don't get it when people are dicks. It doesn't make sense. Well, let's talk about a few of those that you've worked with. Mm -hmm. First one that comes to mind, of course, is... Kevin Ball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what an asshole. Um, uh, <laughs> oddest byproduct of being on the show? 
Do you feel like there's one one in particular that stands out? Byproduct of being on Breaking Bad. Yeah. Hmm. More, more people, people offer me, you meth at parties. People are giving me drugs. Seriously? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> All the time. By I've had people slip drugs into my pockets in bars. Well, with their card. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like this is how you get in touch with me if you want more of this. Yeah. <laughs> what yeah. kind of drugs? Yeah. Um. Uh, drugs. So we're talking multiple kinds of drugs. So we're talking not stuff you can buy here at a pharmacy in California. Uh, well, there's um, it's mostly weed. Okay. But a couple times it's been other things. Okay. Yeah. No blue glass. And, uh, nothing blue. No. And also not um, uh, not in California. It's it's been when I've been other places. Wow. Yeah. That's a pretty cool byproduct. Um, <laughs> Depends on your yes, disposition. Yes and, no. yes and no. Well. I mean, it's cool in the sense that it, it provides one with a story. <laughs> yeah, no, but like, uh, there's been a byproduct of that's extremely annoying, and it's a it's a large part of why I wrote the movie. Like, parts of the movie is like, I'm out to dinner with my mom, and someone screams from across the street, "Hey, Badger, you got any fucking meth?" And you're like, "Nope, I don't. I'm an actor. I'm with my mom. She's Christian. Please stop screaming." <laughs> You know, I'm thinking about your story. People slip drugs into your pockets without you knowing. That sounds like the kind of thing you have to explain to a judge. Yeah. Like, I swear I didn't know it was right. in there. I immediately throw them away. Uh, this I had is... someone come up to me after a show, I don't know, two months ago, and open up a cigarette pack, and there was a joint there, and he said, here, man, this is for you. And I said, I, you know, I think you're going to enjoy that more than me. Yeah. I appreciate the gesture. Thank you. Yeah. Should have seen me 20 years ago. Well, <laughs> more like 30, but yes. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's a form of flattery, I suppose. They are, after all, saying, I like you, please no, take this. Absolutely. In the chat room, this is hilarious. His name is Francis Kelly, and he said, what they should do is slip them drugs, a card, and then a screenplay. Yeah. And then a screenplay. Like, I'm surprised that that's not yeah. the, because that would be the move. Like, that would be the Well, that thing. would be in L.A. That's what I mean. He's saying, yeah, that, yeah right. in L.A. I that was really funny. Yeah. Nice work there, Francis. Yeah, I, uh, it's, um. I had a waiter slip me a screenplay. A waiter. <laughs> really? No, no. It's one thing for a waiter to say, I've written a screenplay. That's trite enough. Actually had it with him. Wow. Yeah. You know, Brought it with the bill. It's balls. It was. And I said, you know what? My hat is off to you. I'm not going to read it, but my hat is off to you for slipping me this I, I'll say this, and I don't give a shit because fuck the guy. Uh, my, ex, my, my wife's ex-boyfriend sure. gave her uh, a script mm. for me mm. to talk to Aaron Paul about. Wow. What that was the biggest. I didn't talk to Aaron. <laughs> hey, Aaron, can you do uh, my uh, wife's ex boyfriend's script? Oh, my God. It was the biggest balls. I, I mean, fuck that guy. But even more than that, the delusion. The, uh, unbelievable of delusion. This will work. That is crazy. I'll give it to Matt, right? Man. We're tight. He'll give it to Aaron. They're tight. This is going to work out easy. Best part? It sucked. <laughs> you read it? I read a couple pages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was bad. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> man, that's beautiful. Okay. Spoiler alert again. I just like the alerts to go out. How delicious it was it when you were sent the script for the final episode? Oh, boy. Wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. Levine family, if you're still watching, bail out right now. Yeah. Just hold up right there. Well, my question, Go without going into detail in any way, shape, or form about the episode, other than the fact that you're in it, was simply how delicious was that to see that you were indeed uh, magically uh, going to appear, as it turns out, in the final episode. I knew that I would be in the final episode always. You'd been threatened. I, I was always, Vince has always promised that we would be in the the final episode. Regardless. That was, yeah. That was something we, we knew. It was more of, oh my God, what if we're not? Yeah. That'll be terrible. Because um, also, you know, as things were moving along, yeah, we weren't. Characters were dying. Yeah, and also we, I actually requested to die. I would love to have gotten, you know, begged for my life and got my head blown off. But uh, they didn't want to kill us, which was nice. Um, I, it was more of like, um, we never knew what was going on. Season three on, I only requested for the pages that I was reading. 
that I was in. You requested? Yes. So I never got the Be full episode. Because you became a fan of the show and didn't want to have anything spoiled yes. for yourself. So I, I would watch the show when it aired, and I didn't know what was going to happen. Other than the scenes you were in. Because my scenes never informed what was going on. I'm just rambling all the time. Right. My character is completely uninformed, <laughs> and I wanted to stay that way. I didn't want to know what Aaron, why is Aaron brooding on the couch? I didn't want to know. Right. Because like, I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I just never... What was so I got to learn. I had no like the the twins with uh, um, Hank and the Axe right. in the parking lot. Didn't know that was going to happen. I didn't know any of that stuff. Fantastic. Didn't know any of it. What was the last thing Badger was pitching? It was like a remake or a movie. Star Wars, uh, Star Trek Star script. Trek script. Star Trek script. An episode of the TV show. Yeah. Not a movie. And the, um, a Vulture Online um, did a, a animated version of it. It's fantastic. Really? Yeah, it's beautiful. Of your of your of Badger's the pitch. Yeah, of me giving the pitch and then cutting to the Star Trek episode occurring while I'm pitching it. Where can people find that? Uh, on Vulture or anywhere. You just go animated Star Trek script. And it'll, it'll turn up. It's now, what did that feel like? That was amazing. Yeah, they did it right away too. Like, I think, I think uh, MC had sent them the idea, and they like it came out the day after the episode aired. It was great. It was really cool. Um, what sort of involvement did you feel and sense from the AMC people as things started to pick up in terms of success of the show? And by the way, for those of us who did join, be it season two, three, whenever that may have happened for anyone, uh, it's still a little surprising to hear that your sense of being on the show, it didn't really kick in until like no. season five or six. Not at all. Seven. No. Like none of us, all of us were still... Oh, not all of us. All the guests, we were struggling, you know. I, I was I was doing my own thing, uh, trying right. to, and then I was like, oh, and I have this job sometimes. And then it just blew up, which was great. And, and people even, Brian won, like, that first year, and still nobody watched. It was weird. We had bad ratings. Well, when he was a guest years. here, I, during, when J-Mac did the research, I discovered this bizarre fact that there was only one other actor in television history who won Best Lead Actor in a Drama three years in a row. Yeah. Other than Brian. Yeah. And you may not be able to guess who it was. Um, no, you won't be able to guess. If you don't know right away, there's no way you'll know. Uh, um, no. Uh, wait, wait, wait. I promise you. I promise you. <laughs> wow. It is. Is it really? No. Oh, my God. <laughs> that would have been awesome. No, but it's as ridiculous. Bill Cosby, I Spy. Really? Three years in a row. But was that lead Three actor? Three years, lead actor. Was, hmm. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Ridiculous. Um, so you're saying even when he was winning Emmys, people, the numbers didn't increase? Not really. Well, same thing with, with Mad Men. It, it won Best Show three, four years in a row. Yeah. And it's, it averages a million, million and a half viewers. Yeah. If that. Yeah. It's, it's all niche. Yeah. Thank uh, goodness. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. But the show almost got canceled a bunch of times, Spring Bad. It barely stayed on. While you're shooting during a season? No, just like the impending doom of like AMC and be like, eh, but everybody, but I was told by them, the guys that work at AMC, the, their, their executives were such fans of the show, they kept it on. That's the thing that saves yeah. any show like that. Yeah. You've got to have some, the right fan. I had one guy tell me, he's like, I voted to keep the show on the air because I wanted to see what was going to happen. Like, that's so great. That's so great. You must be familiar with Jeffrey Katzenberg's effort on how to elongate the final episode. Hmm. He offered Vince, as I've read and heard hmm. from a few alleged reliable sources, $75 million to turn the entire final episode into five-minute chunks that would air once a week until they were done. That's how badly he didn't want the show to end. Wow. Which, 70, that 75 million, first of all, couldn't have spent more than three or four to make the final episode. Wow. So the rest of it goes to Vince and pays him more than, according to these articles I've read. Yeah, more than home fries. <laughs> <laughs> more than he'd made from the series in total. Wow. Uh, other than ancillary rights. That's great. Uh, so how much of a fan is that? Just a guy sitting on a billion dollars and saying, this is my favorite show ever. I don't want it to end. Yeah. Ooh, five minutes once a week. This would be fantastic. That, uh, you know, I'll change my answer. That is the weirdest byproduct of this show is 
super famous people coming up to me yeah. and telling me how much they love the show. Name three. Um, Jeffrey Katzenberg. Yeah. Uh, and how did he say it? Any particular memorable he way? He hired me onto it. Uh, I'm on a new uh, DreamWorks uh, animated movie. Oh, the big animated one. Yeah. Um, <sighs> like that kind of stuff. Or I'm, I'm sorry, Pixar. Right. Uh, I'm in um, Planes 2. It's coming out soon. Uh, like that kind of, uh, um, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Right. I, I developed a script with him for a year um, before he died. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Stephen Colbert. You know, like people, people just like, are coming up to you and saying, yeah, parties, like, oh my God, I love the show. I'm like, I don't, how do you, uh, you know, who I <laughs> scare the shit out of me. Yeah. Like I'm in some weird alternate state, but. It's great. I'm sure you felt the same way when Jamie and I accosted you at Sketchfest. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, same thing. Really weird. Yeah, yeah. It was really weird. It really was. Uh, I, I, sometimes I, thought, I think people are fucking with me. Really? Yeah. I remember, never forget uh, <laughs> back when uh, Fred Armisen and um, Elizabeth Moss were still together. I was at this thing, and they were like, oh, my God, it's you. And I was like, what? <laughs> it's you. And since Fred is so dry, I didn't know if he was making fun of me. Right. And he's like, oh, I love you. And I was like... Oh, that's so mean. This is so <laughs> mean. Why you no, mean? he was actually being genuine. Like, yeah. I really, yeah. And your brain went to, what an asshole. Why, why is he making fun of me? I'm just some guy <laughs> at this party. We, I think also, when I first met him, was um, Odenkirk was there at the same party, too. So that was like, I had like double. Yeah. Oh, it's good stuff, yeah. yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. Um, well, then wasn't Fred surprisingly like that when we, at the uh, Jack that's Black's thing on the pier? We just, just we just walked by him, and and it was that um, look of I, I really, yeah, I really like, love like you. you. Yeah. Yeah. I really yeah. love you. Such a gentle. Yeah. Um, uh, all right, so uh, the fucking that's so amazing about the getting hired from a fan and yeah, I mean, you know. They're they're a wonderful. Th you want you want people that that sort of thing when you're on when you're doing good work. You, your brain goes there every now and then. Yeah. More or less on depending on the person. Of this is a good showcase. Mm -hmm. This will this will show potentially right. So as a show like that is getting its just due as it, as it eventually does. You say 2011, 2012 when it's really kind of blowing up. Um, when doing it, when you guys go back to work, is there any of that sense on the set Absolutely. of finally, finally, can you fucking believe this? Because, yeah. you know, you, you hear from the big hits where, like Matthew Perry said, at the Wednesday run-through of the, of the pilot, we were looking at each other and saying, is, is it me? Yeah. This is crazy, right? It's never this good? Yeah. But to wait four or five years for the audience to decide you're worthy, and then when they do, it's, I mean. Yeah, we were shooting that like Better Call Saul episode in season two, and Brian had just won the first Emmy, and he like brings it on set, and we're all like fucking around with his Emmy and taking pictures and making jokes, and we're just like, this is so weird. This is so weird he got an Emmy. Well, that's not gonna happen again. And like, and everybody Cut was to just, a year later. Yeah, and they're like, oh, it happened again. And then it happened again. And they're like, oh, now everybody's watching it and everybody, and there's like people trying to get in on the set. You know what I mean? Like the Locations? Yeah, and like uh, first season, like eight, third season, nobody was like, what is this? I, why? And they would walk in, in Albuquerque. Uh, now they're selling t-shirts at Target. Now, they're, now they have tours. T-shirts at Target. They are, they sell Bola Tomatoes t-shirts yeah. at Target. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. <sighs> Is um, I make the argument that Gus was arguably one of the greatest television villains of all time. I, He's, I said that. You stole that from me. Okay. He's fantastic, and he is Giancarlo is the sweetest guy, but he is terrifying. I'm so afraid of him. He's just so in that character. No, he, no, he just, just a guy he, sitting he is, around. He's just so like, just so confident and like, you know what I mean? Like one of those electric people that you're like. Man, I could believe you could do anything to me right now. You could hug me, you could murder me. Like he's like, he's just so intimidating in person. He's, yeah, he's a great actor. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've said this a few times, but I'll, I'll, I'll promise to put this to bed and also move away from the topic in, in today's show. But 
If you become a fan of the show, then you realize whoever the main villain is, by the end of the season, that villain must die. And by season four, when it becomes, if you know that, and they have to kill Gus. Mm -hmm. Here's the perfect example of why Vince Gilligan will be one of the greatest uh, writers of all time. He knows that his fans know that Gus must die, and yet the death that he writes for Gus is as surprising to the viewer as if you had never known mm -hmm. that they were going to kill Gus in the final episode. That's how shocking, even though you know they have to kill him, you still look at that death and say, okay, you win. Uh, so for someone who's refusing to read the whole script, it was impossible to guess what was going to happen next on that show. As an actor, you'd pick it up and like, oh, okay. Like you would never be able to guess, right. ever. Yeah. It was really hard to tell where it was going. But you know I mean, that, that pattern by, by season four, that, that pattern had really yeah. sort of shown itself. The twins have to die in the season, you know? Yeah. Uh, wow. So, uh, but there was always a doubt there. Is, is he really going to kill him? Because he was so. Because he was so. Because so he was the greatest TV yeah. villain of all time. Yeah. yeah. So good. Uh, speaking of finales, you uh, become a part of the uh, season fina uh, uh, series finale of The Office, the American version, of yeah. course, The Office. Um, and then a wonderful surprise happens during the filming of it, which apparently went on for quite a while. Mm hmm. Yeah, we shot for two weeks. For two weeks. For a half hour. Yeah. For 22 minutes. Or uh, no, I think it was end up being an hour. But I know it? they have at least three hours of footage. They cut out entire storylines from the finale. Right. Yeah. There was a big surprise uh, appearance. Mm -hmm. uh, was not announced to anyone working on it. He yeah. just strolled onto the set. Yeah. And that was, of course. Steve Carell. It was pretty cool. Did everyone just? Everybody, like people were crying because yeah. they were like series regulars that had been on the show the whole time. Didn't think he was coming. Well, they must have been told he's not coming because yeah, I'm sure a lot of them asked. You bring Stephen back for the finale, right? Everybody's like, he's not coming. Not. He, can't, he can't come. Can't go. He can't do it. Yeah. And then he came and everybody's like, no. And it was weird for some of us who were just like there for bit things. We're like kind of standing off to the side and like letting them have their family moment because it's the end of, you know, nine years for them. Yeah. Where the rest of us like, oh, we're just kind of visiting. It was, it was great. It was really, really surreal to be a part of that experience, too. I would think so. And, like, the other guest stars I'm hanging out with, it's like Ed Begley Jr. and Joan Cusack, and, like, it was, it was, it was really fun. It was really fun. Minnie Kaling came back for the finale, and B.J. Novak, and it was fun. Yeah. And, and you get to, had you been, a, well... Well, they did a spinoff. Right. Uh, that I did um, called The Farm. The Farm. And it didn't go. Right. But then they brought me back a couple times on the show as that character. So the spinoff was scheduled before they were anywhere near this, the show finale. They knew they were going to have the finale, but we shot the spinoff, I don't know, six months before that. Oh, I see. Yeah. So it was like episode five of that season or something like that. Yeah, you were the brother that... Uh, I was the cousin. Cousin. I was brothers with Mose. Oh, right. I was Mose's brother. Right. That was a whole thing. But yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I imagine it was a whole thing yeah. that you're not going to get into now. Yeah. It was great. I became good friends with Rain, and we had, we had a lot of fun doing it, but I think it was better for everybody that didn't go. Yeah. It really was. Because I think there, there's a point where Rain was like, yeah, do I really want to do this for another five years of, you know, that character? And exactly. Now he's, now he's doing Backstrom, which is going to be great. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, are you tired of people asking if Badger's going to show up in Better Call Saul? Yes. Yeah, that's you pretty must annoying. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, of course not. How could you? And it's also a prequel, and I introduced Saul to the series, so technically I don't think I could. Well, though you said you introduced him to the series because he was your attorney. Yeah, but I meet him in that episode. Ah. And it's a prequel, so how could I have met him previous? Can't. Or um, Mathematically speaking. Yeah. If, I, if I may, I think, you just, I think you just announced the finale of Better Call Saul. Yeah. That is the season, the series finale. Series finale. finale. Yeah, that's how this... Right, Kim, coming yeah. into that room with you. Yeah. We'll see you in season seven, <laughs> if all goes well. I'm like 300 pounds. <laughs> hey, they're going to make That's Harrison cool. Ford and Mark Hamill and Carrie Fisher look like oh, God. episode seven happened 30 years ago. I just want some things to die. <laughs> like what else? None. <laughs> I'm, je I'm jealous. I would love to be in Star Wars. But I also, can we have some new stuff? I'm 
was just saying well, that on the way here because we was I was playing I was debating like everyone's telling me to see Godzilla <coughs> and I'm like I just can't get into these tentpole movies yeah. and I'm like can't they create anything original anymore like I, and I'm by, I was like National Treasure was original I like those mm. why is everything it's like it's either a comic book or like they have to reboot something no there is no more original blockbuster tentpole summer movies out there anymore. it's similar to the late seventies when they were doing all those. Shitty blockbuster movies over and over, and then like air, like the um, yeah, all the all the disaster movies. Disaster movies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can see no better segue to who tweeted. Oh, great. Than the discussion of original ideas, ladies and gentlemen. It's time for today's episode of Who Tweeted. Celebrities have so much to say. Who tweeted? Is the game that we just played. Oh, this is going to be a good one. Jamie has, has picked a good one today. She's gotten into the theming. Oh, yeah. As Today's, the head writer of the show, she started to do a little bit of work. Today is no exception. Hi. Hey. No exception. No exception. Please explain. Okay, so here's how Who Tweeted works. Okay. One at a time, I'm going to read a series of eight tweets. Okay. As soon as you or Kevin feel who you know who authored the tweet, you ring in by saying your name, and then I will point to you, and then you will have three seconds to say the name of one of the celebrities who wrote today's tweets. And because our guest is Matt Jones, mm -hmm. we are playing the Jones edition. Oh, the Jones edition! Oh, okay. Who tweeted. So all of these tweets were written by either Orlando Jones, <laughs> Rashida Jones. Oh boy. Or Tom Jones. Wow. Great. Tom Jones has Twitter? Tom Jones <laughs> is on Twitter. At 74 years old, I saw him live at the House of Blues in New Orleans a couple of weeks ago. Doing, he put together this little band out of Nashville and he's doing Tom Waits songs. That's and, great. Oh, man. I love Tom Jones. Unfucking believably cool. Yeah. Wish so, he was my dad. You buzz in, you get it right, you get yourself five points. Buzz in, you get it wrong, you lose three. Mm. Once someone rings in, that's it. They either get it or they don't. We move on mm. to the next question. At the end of eight, unless we have a tie, the winner of Who Tweeted will be walking away with that Andy J. Mm-hmm. Worst president ever. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and say George W. Bush. He, he killed way more Indians. Oh, well. Yeah, let's just. All right. Let's put how about mind. Grant? Let's remind everybody how many Indians. No Grant in this argument? Okay. Are you prepared? Are you ready? Okay. Yeah, I'm ready. Orlando, Rashida, or Tom? Got it. Tweet number one. Food between teeth or on a face immediately transforms. Kevin. Rashida. That is correct. Oh, that's good. Not to a big lead. Fast. I just want, I just want to read the rest of it because it's Yeah, please crazy. do. Food between teeth or on a face immediately transforms even the hottest, coolest, most mysterious person into a sloppy, adorable toddler. Okay. Oh, wow. Pretty good. I should have kept my face shut. Tweet number two. That's a fantastic tweet. Tweet number two was overheard by our tweeter. Overheard, colon. Do animal lovers who multitask still kill two birds with one stone? Matt. Orlando. Jones. That is correct. And we got a tie game. Oh, boy. The board goes back. It's a oh, six-pointer. Oh, boy. Tweet. Wow. Number. Also fast. Three. Somebody came to play. I'm in an NYC cab. It stinks so bad in here you don't even understand. Matt. It's got to be Tom Jones. <laughs> I wish it were. Damn it. I wish it were. <laughs> Orlando Jones. Oh, Orlando man. I want Jones. Tom Jones to say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tweet number four. Do I really name drop that much? Kevin Orlando. Tie game. Yeah. That was your Tom Jones. Do I really name drop that much as Tom Jones? Tom Jones, really? Worries about name dropping. Uh, That's fantastic. I yeah. love him even more. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, Who knows? Tweet number five. New York City. Can you calm down on every level? Matt. Thanks. Rashida Jones. That is correct. Crushing. You know she'd tell New York to you calm down. You know Rashida Jones had ribs once. You and her? You just me and her and got ribs together. I'm going to need that as a follow-up to the game. Yeah, okay. All right. 
Uh, Put a pin in that, Jamie. Will I. Bring us back. Tweet number six. The most disturbing thing a person can say to another person is, do you like to party? Matt. Three seconds. Tom Jones. That's correct. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, Rashida. 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 Wow. Still in the lead, though, Matt. Gotta tell you, still in the How lead. How many questions Four left? Two. Two. We are down to our final two tweets. Okay. Oh boy. The barn burner. Tweet number seven. My turn to have a glass. Smiley face emoticon with the letter D. Kevin. Yes. Orlando. Oh no! <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Tom! Uses a motocar? I know, that's what I saw. Oh my goodness! Tom. He is a... Now here's where we're at, boys. This is the eighth and final tweet. I need to get this correct to tie. That is correct. You, need, you must ring in and get this correct to tie. It's your best, your best hope. And I believe our, our, our uh, competitor today, my competitor, mm -hmm. my opponent, yep. I believe is the correct term, yep. will allow me that opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Because the truth of the matter is, he could weigh it, uh, sell, ring in and get ring it wrong, in, get and, it wrong still win. And, and still win. Still win. But he's not going to play that. I'm not gonna do no, he's an honest man. <laughs> he, like, he likes a straight up game. Let me hang myself. Here we go. On my own petard. Here we go. In online dating world, women are afraid of meeting. Kevin, Orlando, for the tie. We have a tie. Yeah! Oh boy. Oh boy. Thank you for allowing that. We have a time. What a sportsman. And I just want to read this because yes, it's a pretty funny tweet. In online dating world, women are afraid of meeting a serial killer. Men are afraid of meeting someone fat. <laughs> it's pretty accurate. <laughs> pretty accurate. <laughs> the shallowness okay. of men never disappoint. Well, this is it. We we have got ourselves a, a, a tie at four points apiece. So this is this is how the tie works. Only because of fantastic sportsmanship from my opponent. You ring and Again, you get I it commend right. Him. You, you win, you ring and you get it wrong, you lose. It's that simple. It's always nice to do an interview when the only topic is music. Matt. A sup Tom Jones. For the win. That is oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. If, if that was anybody else, that'd be weird. <laughs> no. Rashida. It yeah. totally could have been Rashida. Yes. Lest we forget. Well. That's you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's that how, how you play. you play. Who tweeted? Nice Nicely nice. done by... Celebrities have so much to say. Who tweeted? Is the game that we just played. Um, <laughs> what were you gonna say, Dal? I, 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 I was struggling with the connection for the with the theme for this one, and then it seemed kind of obvious. The Jones game. Yeah, the Joneses. Yeah, I love yeah. it. I contributed Orlando. Yeah, I did. For the record, just just his name, when she was trying to come up with which Joneses to use. Orlando. I said try Orlando. Too bad Tommy Lee Jones doesn't have Twitter. I was yeah. thinking, I know, because I was like, his would be, I feel like, batshit Republican rants or yeah. something. <laughs> and Davy Jones's Twitter stopped a while ago. Weird. I don't know what um, happened. Weird. Don't know why that would be. His phone doesn't work underwater. Yeah. <laughs> you mean for, <laughs> underwater? <laughs> Fantastic! <laughs> I was just going to say, you would think with all the sailor background, he would know how to tweet. Um, uh, all right, so. Uh, the the uh, final uh, uh, questions uh, are are uh, your experience on the mom's show. You know, I don't, uh, I don't. This doesn't have to be any sort of further um, love fest about uh, we mm -hmm. or me. It really about because the 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 research and dossier shows that between or during Breaking Bad, all leading up to Mom, you did about seventy four pilots. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the pilot game, by the way, this story is not unique. You know, no, the, the no. thing about someone like Les Moonves, when he's a fan, stuck by George Clooney, mm -hmm. as the story goes, nine failed pilots in a right. row. Right. Four CBS only. Yeah. Nine in a row. Before ER. Yeah. When, uh oh. The, the rib story. Ah, thank you. I oh. asked the, Jamie to put a pin in that. We'll finish with that one. Okay. So, when you go through the, the, the failed pilot, experience. Mm -hmm. How many before you personally learn the ability to emotionally remove yourself from the process and what the outcome might be while doing the pilot or did that? Never learned. Never, Never learned that. Never learned how to emotionally take myself out of it. But the fact is all the pilots that I did beforehand that didn't go, thank God they didn't go because I got mom. Right. Like it's everything. I'm, I'm very pessimistic and not spiritual in any way. Uh, 
So, but I, I, it is true, like, sometimes, you know, things work out for the best. Yeah. So, as much as I hate to say it. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I try yeah. not to believe in hocus pocus. Yeah. But right. uh, when things do line up. It does. It gets pretty freaky. Like, I, yeah, you know, if I weren't here, then this doesn't happen. Yeah. I mean, if I wasn't in Rob Reiner's face every day working on a failed television show that he mm -hmm. and Christopher Guest created that no one ever really saw, even though six of them aired. If I wasn't in his face every day while he's casting A Few Good Men, there's no way that enters his mind and then the rest of my career follows. Right. Well, through the 90s anyway. And some things that people don't know about like the acting world is that like, I auditioned for a million television shows and within that, you meet these casting directors and you have a relationship and they know you're good, but you're never right for anything they're ever making. And then eventually someday, when they go to cast a show, they bring you in and say, this guy's great. And then the creator or whatever is like, oh my God, I love that guy, thank you for bringing him in. Uh, and then you get the show. Is that you know? how mom? Uh, Chuck is a huge Breaking Bad fan. Uh, but I had also gone in for other stuff. And yeah, it was just, it all, it was very kismet. It was very kismet. It was great. It was fantastic. Yeah. But I had written shows. I would sold shows as a writer, creator, actor, pilots, and those didn't go. And I'm kind of glad they didn't go because if I would have done them, I would have been killing myself for nothing that would have ended or never aired. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I just love this situation. Because this situation, I was able to write and direct a movie in my off time. Yeah. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, it's great. Uh, so from pilot to series, the confident level while doing a pilot for the master known as Chuck Lorre, who uh, at present is arguably the most successful half hour uh, creator, showrunner, having four shows at, on the air at present. I think one of the, I was thinking about this earlier, one of the weirdest and greatest things about working for Chuck and that kind of show is, or, I mean, the way he does shows, because he, the way he does multicam is very different than other people. And like almost everything I've ever done on that's a comedy, like if I'm reading something and it's not very funny and I'm doing it, uh, like people kind of look at you like, why, isn't, why aren't you being funny? This should be funny. Do this, make it funnier. And then sometimes you have to like make it funnier yourself. And or, feeling like you're clowning unnecessarily. Yeah, or, or like, like you're writing it for them in a lot of ways sometimes. And with, Ch with Chuck and the, that whole crew, like, you're going through the rehearsal process and you do it to the best of your ability and it's not funny and they come over like, I'm sorry, that's our bad, try this. And they give you, yeah. they're making it funnier. I do love when he says. I love that. And also that part there, you guys, we, we, we'll do some work on that. Yeah, like it's their, like yeah. it is, it's their job and they, they do it so well. Yeah. And like, I, I've done a million things where you're doing it and the, the writer, the director comes over and gives you a note and you're like, Okay, I'll, I'll do that. And then you do it, and you're like, yeah, it still didn't work, man. And Chuck, every note he gives you, and you do it, it works. It's uh, a little like, astonishing. It's creepy. Actually. Like, you're like, it's I mean, you so dead on. A guy that's been in the trenches that long, dating all the way back to Roseanne, and probably before, um, would have a great level of knowledge. But they rarely do. They, yeah, it's like a mad scientist. Like is. He really breaks down scenes on a... I've never like gotten a, notes from in any film or any job ever that weren't as consistent. Yeah. I mean, ever. It's ridiculous. It's astonishing. And also, just the... Uh, take your time with that. We're doing, yeah. a, we're doing a sitcom, right? I right. feel like I want to whisper. Yeah. Yeah, take your time. Let that moment... Uh, don't feel like you have to rush to get to the job. Yeah, and don't feel like you have to play it so big. It's, it's funny on its own. I'm like, that's great. That's it great. really is. I found myself one day... Hitting one particular word, yeah, and then the attorney go over to notes and he said, "Yeah, you don't have to do that. You really don't have to." Think. And then you go and you do it, and you're like, "Oh wait, he was right." You do it without taking yeah. such a big swing, and you go, "What was I doing?" Yeah. Ah, oh, what a yeah. Um, the show is moving its time slot. Big announcement, ladies and Jews. Mom, staying on Monday nights, uh, but moving from 9:30 back to 8:30. Uh, kicking off the season following the Big Bang Theory. What a horrible lead-in. It's the worst <laughs> possible scenario. Um, one, uh, being facetious, of course, but one could argue in a very insecure, paranoid uh, thinking way. You kind of have to deliver. No? I'm not worried about that. It's the best lead-in on television. No, by far. On television that yes. you could have. Yeah, and comedy and, for sure. And I, I think our show is really good and just yeah. 
I think it's really good. I I'm think, not worried I think about there'll it. be a much better shot in the first six weeks when following uh, Big Bang before it moves back to Thursday. That the, uh, a ginormous audience that may not be familiar with the show will have a chance to see it for the first time. And the, the astonishing thing to me about Big Bang's success is it's not a A demographic. It's across the fucking board. Mm -hmm. It's every age. You would think, or I foolishly thought, that it's um, characters, not necessarily the scripts or the written, mm -hmm. but the characters themselves would appeal to a like-minded age group. And right. in fact, it's across the board. It's ridiculous. My 82-year-old yeah. mother loves the show more than life itself. Yeah, yeah. My parents in their 60s and 70s love the show. The yeah. drunks of the Eagles love it. The drunks of the Eagles love it. They do. And Bang Theory. And I'm like, they, the drunks of the Eagles. Chuck and Diane are sitting at the end of the bar watching it all the time. Yeah. That's where the song came from also, right? Chuck and Diane? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Little Diddy? That's Jack and Diane. Sorry. Of course it is. Ch it, was the, it was the second one. It was <laughs> the yeah. sequel. It's a B-side. No, <laughs> Diane left Jack for Chuck. <laughs> Little Diddy about Chuck and Diane. Diane. <laughs> Jack died. <laughs> <laughs> Diane is alone. <laughs> oh, it's great to be Homer Simpson. I love getting it wrong um, and becoming my father. Her name's Krabappel? I've been calling her Crandall. <laughs> <laughs> um, can't thank you enough. Oh, thank you for Honestly having me. and truly, for uh, a long overdue, I want to hear more about the film, but uh, the, the editing process now, then you, you have a uh, self-imposed deadline? Yeah, yeah, we're gonna have a hard cut by August. By August? Yep. In order to submit to Sundance? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So, uh, here's hoping we have a whole lot more to discuss. Absolutely. Once you have that done. Congratulations, yeah. by the way. Yeah. You know what's weird is the, the blood in the water already. We've had so many people contact us about foreign rights. It's that fast. Holy shit. We're not even done editing. Just because of people in the movie. Yeah. I'm telling you. It's great. Well, tell, tell me a little bit more about that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like people, like, it's like uh, real estate agents. Yeah. You're going to sell your house? I'd love to be a real estate agent. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I've already talked to people about buying your, like, it's like that. Yeah. And so we've had a lot of people contact us about wanting to rep us to sell foreign rights. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. Like people trolling IMDb, I have no idea. Well, it turns out, because we, we got a little bit of that on the documentary, it turns out uh, that's how sales rep get about 60% of their business, yeah. which is heads up ball on their part mm -hmm. to go look for it. And then it's the ultimate compliment to you as a filmmaker yeah. that you made the cut in their mind of how can I make money? Because that's clearly what anyone in that job would care about. And to then hone in on your project and say, there's gold in them, our hills, is the kind of vote of confidence and affirmation that come what may. The yeah. fact that they're come calling that's pretty terrific. It turns out that there is a huge Breaking Bad following in UK, Europe, and South America, which is great. Yeah. Just great. Please send checks. Please help me pay for the movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, now, yeah. Uh, this was a leap for you and Kelly. Yeah. Uh, your bride, who worked on the film. Mm -hmm. Experience working with your bride? Was this the first time you guys worked together? Yes. She, she was helped produce it, and it was just... It's a lot of work. Yeah. It was really, really hard, but it was the most fun I've ever had in my life. And shortly after or during, you moved into a new house? Five days after we wrapped, we moved into a new house. Yeah. You guys are still together? Yep. <laughs> okay. So all that's left, I think, is a drive across country. Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, and the death of one of our parents. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Those are the only two things to survive. Yeah. We've already driven cross country. Ah. Oh. Mm-hmm. Ah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, we've wow. done it all. Yeah. You guys really will be together. Yeah, and she's way out of my league. Well, <laughs> she really everyone is. who knows and loves you. Yeah. We have regular meetings. On yeah. Her. We get together. It's obvious. We get together once a month. Every time I put her picture on Instagram, people are like, "Really? That's your wife?" Like, yeah. Yep. She's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> turns, out, turns out. Yeah. Um, well, congratulations on all of it. Um, honestly and truly. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the fact that we would have cost someone and uh, they well, ended up being a much better person than we would have hoped Good. <laughs> has been incredibly helpful. Jamie, you put a pin in we're, and we're now finally coming back to... See that sign on there? It's a rib tips. Oh, rib tips. Oh, rib, tips. Go there. Um, ribs. 
Uh, <laughs> that way you don't want to go that way. <laughs> Is that what you were doing? You're pointing to your ribs? When uh, I was at Boom, uh, Chicago. Our, Boom Chicago, um, Seth Myers would come back all the time to hang out. And one of the times he came back, uh, Rashida came with him because they were friends. To Amsterdam. And, to Amsterdam. And uh, everybody was busy one day, and uh, me and Rashida had nothing to do. And we went and got lunch at my favorite rib joint. There's this one place called De Close in Amsterdam. It has some of the best ribs in the world for some weird reason. And uh, I took her there, and we ate ribs like animals, and it was really fun. Yeah. Yeah, and she's the only person I'll let me call Jonesy. Really? Yeah. Because she's a Jonesy. Because she well. thinks she's Jonesy. Oh. I'm, I'm yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty great. Yeah. Um, but she's an actual, you know, Quincy Jonesy, so. Yeah. <laughs> she wins. She, yeah. <laughs> well, technically. Yeah. On a technicality. Um, that's cool. And yeah. thank you, Jamie, for reminding me twice that I asked you to put a pin in that story. Okay, I think you know what's left. It's called the Larry King game. Shall oh. I familiarize you with it? Which camera am I? This one? Yep. Okay. Okay. I'm sure you worked on it prior. I didn't. I didn't. What are you doing again? <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but as an improviser who uh, had their voice change after playing 10,000 shows in Europe, mm. Um, I thought this is pretty good to throw at you. So I want a bad Larry King. I don't want a good one. I okay. want a bad one. All right. That's, Pressure's off. Yep. No good. problem there. And then just that little moment that Larry would look into camera and share something about himself that nobody wanted to know. And again, you're not sharing things about yourself, Matt. Got it. No, I got it. About Larry you King. are Larry. Embody got Larry. Got it. And know that he walked with dinosaurs. Yeah. So go anywhere. Okay. Share a little something about Larry, from Larry, and then go to the phones. Okay. And when you go to the phones, if the name of the city is funny sounding, right. it won't hurt the bit. Okay. Fire when ready. <laughs> um, what does he say? Like, I'm Larry King? Yeah, you can be anyone. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's fine. That's acceptable. Turns out I like my sandwiches like I like my women. Simply dressed with loose meat. <laughs> <laughs> Schaumburg, Illinois, you're on the phone. <laughs> Schaumburg! <laughs> the wealthy suburb outside of Chicago, named is Schaumburg. Nice, Paul. Oh, boy. Loose <laughs> meets the block. It turns out. Yeah. It turns out, by the way. Yeah, yeah. It turns out. <laughs> it turns out. Yeah. Looking back. I had a sandwich this morning, and I was looking at the sandwich thinking to myself, you know what? Yeah, it reminds me of the women I knew. <laughs> Thank out. you. Thank no, you very thank much you. for Thanks that, Thanks for pal. having me, man. Honestly and truly. Uh, great fun for us, and um, and also you uh, you know you shared a lot of things I don't think you planned on sharing. No, I can't ask for more than that. Get in trouble, so no, I, I just mean the whole shitting the sailor suit incident. Good, uh, <laughs> you know I'm sure when you were driving here, sure you were thinking, oh, my office can't come play. Up. Talk about shitting my pants. <laughs> Next week uh, we'll be off for the memorial uh, celebration. Uh, Jamie will be visiting New Orleans for her very first time, and then hopefully report back. I've been to New Orleans Square plenty. Ah, <laughs> you're referring to that uh, area of Disneyland. Yes. I see. Um, same thing. Buddy. Yep. Same thing. <laughs> same thing. Gumbo and wrought Pirates iron. And haunted mansions. Wrought <laughs> iron balconies. Uh, and then the following week, June first, will be another guest host, Paget Brewster. <laughs> Uh, our guest not yet uh, booked, but will be announced soon on the Twitter for look for that. Uh, also, um, Matt Jones is dead. At Matt Jones is dead, is uh, is where you'll find our guests on the Twitter. Um, I'll be on at midnight this Wednesday. Really? Yeah. All right. Nice. So if you're if you're getting us uh, on the Earwolf Tuesday tomorrow night, uh, when this, our show drops on Tuesdays, I guess everywhere drops uh, tomorrow night, Wednesday night. Uh, the at midnight on Comedy Central. Yeah. Yeah. Literally at midnight. At midnight. Um, did you, you must have shot it already. No. The oh, they shoot that day. They, they shoot, shoot that, that day. day. Yeah. Okay. Um, so don't fuck it up. <laughs> now that we've told people to watch. <laughs> good, good. All right. Cool. Uh, so I will thank uh, Dr. Chen once again, as always, very much for uh, doing an exceptional job for practically nothing. Sammy, uh, thank you for doing an exceptional job for absolutely nothing. <laughs> uh, Jamie, same to you, on all ends. Uh, I think the Jones theme worked out phenomenally. And uh, as always, when the guest wins, it's better. It, way better. Way better. Way better, for yeah, me yeah. especially. Well, <laughs> except for the fact that the 20 comes from you, I think it's always better. Here's the thing. The guest always gives it back to me. When you win, <laughs> you always keep it. <laughs>
<laughs> wow, what a way to tell Matt he should give you the funny. <laughs> <laughs> and good luck prying it from his cold, dead hand. Uh, Josh Negrin, Jason McIntyre, Samantha Ward, Danielle Overland. <laughs> so and, proud of you. And we missed our, uh, our David... Uh, who was that? No, he's, 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 he's in, in Israel. Israel. He's, he's doing the uh, the Jew Pride thing. Really? Yeah. Is that we're gonna Samantha call it did it. All right, it's called Birthright. Birthright. <laughs> Jew Pride, Birthright, same thing. Pride. Uh, I think he's, it's the 10 day trip mm -hmm. for David Mandel. We'll see him back. Well, you guys will see him back on June 1st with Rashida, and then I'll be back on the 8th. Rashida. And then Sammy takes, I think, the following one get her as a guest. on the 15th. Indeed. Yeah. Sammy will be hosting that one. You, you need to book that one. With pleasure. I'm counting on you. Okay. All right. Um, and thanks again to the Regimen for reminding me that uh, here in my 50s, I've got all the uh, testosterone I can use. <laughs> and nowhere near enough estrogen to be a problem. <laughs> uh, I think that's it. You got it. Until next time, and as always, where is it? Wait for it. The fuck happened to my cup? <laughs> I can see it. Thank you. Until next time, and as always, get out of my face. <laughs>